It's Wednesday, the 2nd of September, and today in the news media is being reported the story about the jetpack guy getting too close to airliners on final approach to Los Angeles International Airport. But nobody in the media could very well explain exactly what was violated. What airspace rules did this operator of this jetpack violate? My name's Juan Brown, you're watching the Blanco Lirio channel, and I'm gonna explain all that right now. On Sunday night, Americans flight 1997, that's the A321 Transcon flight that flies from Philadelphia to Los Angeles, reported the jetpack pilot on a 10 mile final to Los Angeles. In this case, the, the aircraft would be landing to the west, probably to 25 left, the south complex. LA has four runways, two on the south side of the airport and two on the north side of the airport. And he first reported the jetpack pilot at 3,000 feet, 10 miles away from Los Angeles, about 300 yards off the left side of the aircraft. This was corroborated by a second airliner behind American's flight 1997, and then a third uh, JetBlue, I believe it was, was looking for the traffic but didn't see him. Flight 1997 landed about 6.37 p.m. When they're landing to the west like that, this time of year, the sun is setting pretty much in front of you, which further can obscure your visibility coming into Los Angeles. However, the, was, the weather was reported clear at the time. Airspace over your head is not just free space. Airspace is tightly regulated, and you gotta be able to read a sectional VFR, visual flight rules chart, to understand what airspace is what, and Los Angeles airspace is some of the most congested airspace in the country. At 10 miles east of Los Angeles at 3,000 feet, this puts the pilot of that jetpack right clearly smack dab in the middle of Class B, Class Bravo airspace, some of the most tightly constricted airspace in the country. The whole concept of Class B airspace, and it's traditionally explained as an inverted wedding cake, is to provide very tight control of arrivals and departures of airliner traffic and keep those corridors clear of all other, most other traffic to allow the very busy operations. If you look at Los Angeles, these airlines are stacked up just three minutes, well, less than three minutes apart, all the way down the line, visually coming in on the ILS instrument approach into Los Angeles. Very, very busy airspace. In order to enter Class B, Class Bravo airspace, you gotta meet a number of requirements. And this pilot of this jetpack was apparently in violation of all of these requirements. Requirement number one, you have to have a clearance from ATC, air traffic control, to enter the Class B airspace. In order to have a clearance and be cleared into that airspace, you obviously need a two-way radio that works so that you can talk to ATC. Not only do you need to have a two-way radio that works, you also need to have an operational transponder with mode C altitude readout capability to enter this airspace. And the other piece you need is in recent legislation, you need ADSB out as well, and the transponder and ADSB out are the two different forms of technology to help prevent traffic collisions by allowing the pilots to view all the traffic around them on a fish finder style scope inside the aircraft or a map, if you will. It will map out and show you all the different traffic that is ar around you. And of course, TCAS can give you traffic collision avoidance instructions. Better known in the industry as a resolution advisory. And in order for TCAS to work, and to work very accurately, it needs the transponder data, the mode C data, and the ADSB data. 
In order to operate in Class B airspace, you also need to hold at least a private pilot's license or better. And this is to make sure that you fundamentally understand the rules about airspace, the very rules we're talking about right now. You also need, in order to operate visually, three miles in clear clouds is the minimum weather requirement to operate in Class B airspace. At least <laughs> that rule was not violated so that the jetpack man and the airliners were able to see each other and avoid each other in this airspace conflict. So the FBI is investigating, but first they got to find out who the perpetrator was, who was the guy in the jet suit. It's quite easy that he was able to land and drive away, and very likely they never will find the guy. If the jetpack man is found and they can determine that he was in fact flying the jetpack at the time that this incident occurred, which will be kind of hard to prove unless he just confesses up to it, if this, if this individual held any kind of a pilot certificate at all, he's going to be in very serious trouble with that pilot certificate rating. If he has no pilot certificate rating at all, local jurisdiction or FBI can still slap some serious fines on him for violating this airspace. So jetpacks represent an amazing new technology that I'm very interested in. I just... We just hate it when knuckleheads like this make a big splash on the national news and it's going to set the technology back seriously with bad press for just doing knuckleheaded maneuvers like this and flying in airspace in which you should never have been operating in in the first place. So I hope that gives you a little bit better understanding of what the rules and regulations are around Los Angeles International Airport and the possible violations that this individual could be facing. And breaking news on the Blanco Lirio channel here, as I announced previously on my Patreon channel, I've been flying the airlines for years, as you know, and flying out of Los Angeles for years, and I'll be going back to work soon after this medical, I got this medical situation all resolved, um, but I will not be going, no soup for you! I will not be going back to the 787 as I was hoping to get trained up to do. Um, apparently nobody junior to me in the 787 bid status at Los Angeles came in the whole time I've been out for the last year and a half for this medical deal and so I have to go by the rules of the contract everything in the airline industry is very contractual regarding labor and seniority and so I gotta go back to the Boeing 777 so that's that's fine I'm fine with that uh, it just it means it's a, uh, it's inefficient if if we're going to retire the Boeing 777 and I want to go to the 787 why not just send me to the 787 at this time but because of the way the rules of the contract are that you can't <laughs> it's built in inefficiencies in a major airline that has a lot of different aircraft fleet types and other breaking news we're beginning to all right let me get pete stand by Pepe, you're on get your hat where's your Blanco Lirio hat and in other breaking news, the merch is finally starting to roll here on the Blanco Lirio channel. These, you can get one of these new Blanco Lirio hats. A Blanco Lirio fan, Roger, out in Oklahoma, has begin to, begun to embroider these hats. So I want to put you directly in contact with Roger if you want to get one of these hats. Come on over to the Patreon channel. The Patreon subscription is what helps keep this channel going because much of this content on YouTube is demonetized because of the nature of some of the content that we discuss, particularly regarding aviation disasters. So come on over to Patreon. I'll give you all the top secret information on how to get a hold of Roger and get one of these embroidered hats at a very reasonable rate. I'm not taking a cut out of the deal. I just want to send you directly over to Roger and get one of these hats. Also, we should soon have some t-shirts become available as well. Waiting for them patiently in the mail here. We'll check them out, see what they look like, and then I'll get all the information to you so that you can directly go get one of these t-shirts as well. So thank you so much for your support over on Patreon for making this content possible. See you here. Say goodbye, Pete. Bye. Say kablamo. Kablamo! <laughs> Say, see you here. See you here.